All right, if everyone could uh, have a seat and be quiet now, please, we're going to start again. Thank you. All right, asking, uh, asking our first question is Bob Nicholson, and then on deck is Patty Quinn. So Bob, we'll just move the microphone here. Thank you, sir. And again, candidates, you have 90 seconds. If somebody wants to rebut, just kind of like wave at me or whatever you want to do. And for the people that are asking questions, if your topic's already been addressed, uh, please uh, just tell them you'd like to pass your turn, and a question must be posed within 60 seconds. Mr. Nicholson. Okay, this is, uh, you had it aired in the paper this morning, but I'd like to hear your thoughts on the one employee policy. Are you for it or against it, and why? Thank you, and for the second half of the forum, uh, we're gonna go left to right this time, and we will start with John. Thank you very much, an excellent question. Um, I'm completely against it for the following reasons. I believe that city council has the right to go and talk to any staff member they wish um, that works for the city of Penticton, whether they're managerial uh, directors or whatever they happen to be. Um, I don't want to have to go a, through a third person in order to get my point across. I get every year, I get hundreds of e emails and hundreds of telephone calls of people complaining about certain things that are being done um, in, in the community that they don't like and they want, they want them to be changed. Um, and the way I can get the answers that I need and the answers that they need is for me to speak to them directly so they can get those folks on the phone and explain in person exactly what it is that's happening and why it's happening and if it can be approved. But that doesn't mean that I as a counselor or the mayor can go up to a staff member and get them to go and do whatever project I want them to do that will cause financial difficulty for the community. I will never do that. That is done by city council and by vote by city council. But I do believe that we need the freedom on city council. After all, we are the ones that are elected, not the one, the, the one um, member that everybody goes to in order to talk to anybody else. Thank you very much. Thank you. Eucalarios. Uh, as to the one, one employee policy, I think it's a very good idea. It's actually a very ancient concept. Um, most monarchers used to have an advisor that would take care of the administrative affairs for themselves. Councillors, mayors are very busy people. They got all kinds of important political things to be doing. The legwork of actually doing the research, finding answers, uh, looking things up, that should be left to somebody that's like the one, one employee person. They're the ones that'll have the regular connections with the people, they're the ones that know the right people to ask. As long as the reports are efficient, as long as they're cohesive and they get their information in a timely fashion, it would truly save councillors and the mayor lots of their personal time and their valuable time that they can use for other things. I do that myself. I, have, I, I, will, I will actually delegate to an individual that works for me a good deal of doing my research for me because I don't have the time for it. And it's a very good policy because they get very familiar with what's going on and it provides for a continuity. Because after the council, when the mayors are gone and the councillors are gone, a whole bunch of new people come in, they got all kinds of new brand new ideas. The one employee that's maintaining everything can sort of uh, provide a transition uh, from one government to the other government. It provides a continuity in, in governance. It makes the whole project conti contiguous so that everybody can have a hand in it and everybody knows what's going on. And the reports are available to everyone at one time. So as opposed to having one councillor running around doing their own little thing, another one doing their own little thing, have it all together as a collective place. Thank you. And Andrew Jacobite. Uh, thanks for the question, Bob. I, I like the policy. I th think it, it's always been in place. It's just been more re-emphasized because in the past, uh, certain councillors would go and start giving direction, go fill the pothole over there, go do this, someone complain about a tree, go cut it down, that type of thing, where we can't be doing that. Every councillor has the opportunity to go talk to staff, uh, senior or mid middle, ma middle management, uh, get their questions or the uh, constituents' questions addressed. 
but I think if you're going to ask staff to create a bunch of uh, research to go on a subject, it should be going through someone else because now all of a sudden if someone else asks for that same research and now this staff person has to choose between which counselor, this counselor asked me that, that counselor asked me that, I got to get a deadline, I have a deadline to get another report done, who do I choose, what is my priority? So when there's direction being given to staff, that has to be funneled through someone and that's what council is supposed to do. Uh, we make the, the policies and staff go out and implement that. Uh, Part of my vision is empowering council and is improving that flow of information from uh, management to council so we're in the loop uh, on a more regular basis. That was another reason for me meeting uh, weekly instead of twice a month. And uh, we do have a policy where if you ask a question, it gets answered. All of us in council get that, so we stay informed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next uh, speaker is Patty Quinn, followed by Kyle Anderson. This is my question to all of you. Um, Martin Street. I, I personally am not impressed. Step up, please. Step up, please. Uh, sorry. Can you hear me? Yeah, we'll, we'll reset the time. So, okay. So starting now, go ahead. I'm not impressed with Martin Street. I think uh, for seniors, um, if you park, you have chains trying to get out the door. Um, you are up high, so you can't, seniors can't get out if, you, if they need help. It's, um, the interlocking blocks are breaking. I've been down there. Uh, those posts or, and chains that are there, it looks like we need horses and buggies. <laughs> Sorry, that's just the way I feel. And I want to know, if you go with the 100 and 200 blocks, if you're going to do more of the same. And the other thing is, is it cost effective to maintain? The other thing is, seniors have to walk to your, get your a question. parking ticket. Your so question. I would like to know your opinions on the cost effectiveness and of maintaining these okay. infrastructures once they're in place. Okay, thank you. Okay, do you want to answer that, Yuka? Uh, I'm, I'm glad that you brought that up because that Martin Street thing is a personal pet peeve of mine. Uh, it's a beautiful looking thing, I'll tell you the truth. It is beautiful, it's nice interlocking blocks and it looks like a nice walking mall with the chains down there and you'd expect to have little picnic table or little tables out there with the cafe tables and other kind of things. But to park on that interlocking brick, it's gotta be some of the most expensive parking surface in the city. If we're going to park on it, use blacktop. I mean, like, it makes no sense. But it is a beautiful walking mall, and they should beautify the region and actually use it as some kind of theme, because it, it, it is a special location. It's specially, you know, it's got a special color to it, a special design. Turn it into some kind of theme type of area, a section of the city that's a walking mall or some kind of thing that's not parking. Thank you, Yuka. Andrew Dragobite. Um, I, I think the plan for the 100 and 200 block of Main Street is, is different than Martin Street. I mean, yes, we are trying to enhance the pedestrian experience. Uh, and like on Martin Street, we're enhancing uh, opportunities for business frontage to make it a little bit easier for sidewalk cafes and to program that street. So if you want to shut it down for a festival or a market, uh, you can actually use the sidewalk, uh, the business can use the sidewalk. So it's, it's, it is a bit more programmable. Uh, I've not been made aware of the blocks, how, how they are in terms of maintenance or an issue, and maybe there's lessons learned uh, from that to take on to any other new project. That's about it. Thank you. Thank you. And John Vasilaki. Thank you very much. Excellent question. I voted against this project, not because it, it wasn't the right thing to do, but because it went to the wrong spot. I believe that 1.4, 1.5 or whatever that we used, what we spend on that should have been spent on Main Street because that is the core of the city of Penticton is Main Street, not Martin Street. <laughs> <clears throat> and again, the same thing happened on that street where at the last minute, three banks were thrown into, into the picture in order to make sure that it passes. Don't forget, they don't only pass by the how many people or how many owners vote for it, but it also passes by how, how much the value of those buildings are that make that 
really determines whether something is going to pass or not. Those three buildings really controlled the value of what happened on Mar Martin Street, and that's why it happened. And I voted against it, not because of the, it's not beautiful because it's gorgeous, but because it should have been on Main Street, where it should have been to begin with. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> is doing our sound tonight, but he's allowed to ask a question, I guess. And Janine uh, Nicholas, you're up after Kyle. Being accused of being allowed, it's never happened to me before. <laughs> Gentlemen, I was born in Penticton. I've watched the downtown change and grow over the years. I've watched the neighborhoods change and grow over the years. I have a problem with the focus. Downtown revitalization seems to be the big word. It's all about increasing the beauty, the cosmetic beauty of the downtown core in order to draw more people to Penticton. I get the impression that this and previous councils have forgotten the fact that some people actually already live here. I live across from the biggest capital expenditure Penticton has ever seen the SOEC, I have no curbs or sidewalk, as do many other neighborhoods in Penticton. Do, I will address this to all of you, and I will ask you, will you continue along this direction, or you will, will you refocus capital energies towards the improvements of the people who already live here? Thank you. They, uh, they don't cheer that loud when you sing, Kyle. <laughs> okay, uh, question on the floor, and Andrew, you're up next to answer. Thanks, Kyle. Good question. Um, well, everyone uses their downtown. Downtown is where we gather as a community. Downtown is that gauge where people come to see, is this a vibrant community? Is this something I should be, I spoke to this before, is this a place we should be investing in? So it is a priority, and our, our citizen engagement, our citizen surveys talked about if you're going to do anything, do it in the downtown. Yes, we need to look at some of the other infrastructure around the community, and, and sometimes when you only have a, a little pot of money, and everyone's very conscious of, don't raise my taxes, so we got to find that balance of doing some uh, strategic priorities, some improvements for the large, the large mass of the community, but also to find uh, individual neighborhoods that have been neglected, individual neighborhoods that, that need some infrastructure improvement. So it's, it's difficult to find that balance because the last few uh, councils, we've all had 0% uh, increases. Of, you know, last year was the first year we actually had an increase uh, in four years. Thank you, Andrew. John Boswaki. Thank you, Kyle. Um, I've also lived in Penticton most of my life, 60 years of it. Um, I was a young lad when we moved here, and I remember P Penticton as a very, very tiny little town with a population of about 8,500 8, people. Now we're 33. We should be 53, but unfortunately, people don't stick around or they don't come. For the 12 years that I've been on city council, I've been harping on city staff that we should look after our infrastructure before anything else. Without infrastructure, you cannot bring people into the downtown core or anywhere, anywhere else in the community. They just don't want to live there if they don't have sufficient water, sewer, sidewalk, curbs, or everything else. Uh, I've seen many streets that we have put new asphalt on, but no curbs. And within two years, those streets have fallen apart because there's nothing to stop the asphalt from falling off all the time. So we have to look after our infrastructure first and more foremost. The, the federal uh, conventions that they have uh, once a year, just like we have BC, uh, UBCM here, they always stress on infrastructure and they continue to push the federal government to put more money in, into municipalities to take care of those uh, th those parts that we, we require. Water, switch, roads, Th and the people Thank living you. comfortably in our community and make them want Your to time's come up, and John. live here. Thank you. Thank you.
And Eucalario, you're lost. In part of my platform, I clearly stated that we have grass coming out of the sidewalks downtown, and a lot of this, it's unmaintained, not well kept. Part of having a beautiful city is maintaining the, the citizens of the city in good repair. There's two kinds of things that we do. One is the maintenance of the city, and that's part of the regular thing. Each community should have, their, if their community isn't, isn't finished off yet, there should be some kind of list as to when their turn comes. And in the meantime, we should also maintain the sidewalks and the things we got, because if we've got grass growing through the sidewalks, it's going to break down a lot faster, and we're going to have to replace them a lot more, which is a capital cost. We're going to have to put a little bit of ounce of prevention style into maintaining the city. The downtown revitalization project is, is a project. It's an individual kind of goal kind of thing, and it's not the same as maintaining the city. It's something we look at for a capital expenditure to attract more business to the city. And we have to focus on both at the same time, but you can't really, we have to make some small sacrifices because we're not really you know, incredibly wealthy at this point in time. But at the same time, we have to have a regular sort of maintenance structure in place that takes care of the citizens because that's part of what makes the city look good. If we have beautiful sidewalks, nice little neighborhoods, people will take more pride in their neighborhood, take more pride in their neighborhood, they'll paint their house more often, make a nicer house and a garden and all that kind of stuff. But we have to give them a pretty place to start with. Thank you. So we'll draw another. So just before, okay, just before Janine Nicholas goes, we'll get somebody on deck. Oh. Brian Wilson, you'll be on deck. Janine. Good evening, gentlemen. You just finished saying pride. In this community, we have neighbors on the east and the west. What has been the goal and the vision with the working relationship within the Penticton Indian Band? I hear the buzzword now. What have you invested prior to this campaign as relationship, as welcoming our neighbors, because I see ourselves as a community. I want to know your opinion on that, and what are you going to do to ensure, as a community, that we are going to be accepting of all, because we are in a multicultural place. Thank you. Good question. <laughs> Mr. Basilaki. Thank you very much, Janine. That's an excellent question. Uh, most of the people that live uh, on PIB lands I grew up with a lot of them. I went to school with a lot of them. Their parents, by the way, uh, and the, their, um, their children have gone to school with my children. I've done a lot of business with them uh, through my restaurants and other businesses and, and construction stuff that I've done with them. So I know them very, very well. Uh, I respect them uh, for what they are, um, I, and I, I always will. I believe that as a city council, we should have more meetings and more uh, cohesive of understanding with them because they have a different culture than we do and they they think differently than, than, than we do just like the Greeks think a lot differently than the Canadians do and I'm one of those guys and I think different than a lot of other people uh, you know I think I hope it's for the bet for the better uh, <laughs> but uh, I, I, I try uh, I try to make sure that um, that I'm always honest uh, and, and I look after the, the people uh, that have entrusted me uh, to be uh, on city council. And I feel the same thing about the PIB. We've done a lot of things together with them. We've given them um, a sewer line and many other things so that they can improve their lands and fulfill uh, the, the, uh, their obligations to their own people. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Lario. Um, for me, it's kind of simple, because I owe the Penticton Indian Band a debt of gratitude for letting me stay on their land for so long. I don't know if you noticed I'm white. Um, I have a really good relationship with them. I understand them. I have a little bit of advantage over these others because I have actually participated in Native communities. I've been in sweat lodge ceremonies. I've participated in their potlucks, their potlatches, and other, other sacred ceremonies they have. There are people just like us. They have the right to get rich and famous just like us. Uh, we should actually start talking with them, like on above board, you know, on the table discussions, because their development over there is basically our our savior. They have that. That's a huge project. There's only about 1,400 of them out there on on that land, and there's only about 250, 300 of them that are unemployed. They're not going to be able to do this 
on their own. They're not going to be able to build this thing with 250 people, a gas station, a corner store, and a burger joint. They're going to need us to cooperate with them to, to build this project. And it's much to, uh, more to our benefit, as much as it is to their benefit, to work together with them and cooperatively have certain goals and objectives that'll better the com both communities simultaneously. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Jacobite. Thanks for the question. Um, we talk about working relationships and I, I think that starts with more meetings. We, I think we've had a council to council meeting maybe every 12 to 18 months. We really should be having them uh, regularly two or three times a year. The, the mayor and the chief should be meeting monthly. We don't have a lot of land here, and so when we're trying to attract business, you have very few uh, land, pieces of land in the industrial area, and the ones that are there are very expensive. Uh, so there's a great opportunity to build uh, development and uh, industry here on PIB land. Quite exciting to have Chris Scott, who was the architect, if I could use that word, in getting the Asuyas Indian Band, a lot of the development is going down there. He's now working for the Penticton Indian Band, and you're seeing Sky Hills, they're already sold out phase one, they're working on phases two and three. It's a lot of, lot of opportunity. There are, there are partners, and you know, it is about how we can have both communities prosper harmoniously, because people are going to come into our community and, uh, to work and play and, and live, and it doesn't really matter if a business is set up on, on First Nations land or in Pentecostal land, we as a community, we are, are going to benefit. So it's quite exciting and we should be talking more with them and working with them and, and that's starting to happen, which is quite exciting. They just opened their four million well, wellness center. Like, there's a lot of things happening. They're going to have a salmon, salmon hatchery on the, on the Okanagan River Channel. That'll be a good cultural draw, a tourism draw. Uh, a lot of cool things are happening and it's quite exciting. Thank you. Thank you for the question. And I'm calling somebody to the on-deck circle, and that person will be Carrie Schneiderat, uh, one of our chamber people. Thank you. Mr. Wilson. Yes, good evening, candidates. Um, heritage tourism works in other communities to a tremendous extent. We have the jewel that sits on our lake, uh, 62 years sitting in the mud, uh, with the potential to become a... A uh, tremendous draw for people that are involved in going to the Revelstoke Railway Museum, the uh, Cranbrook Rail Railway Museum, the, even the Kettle Valley Steam Railway. Um, this town of 31 to 33,000 people doesn't need two museums. Would these candidates, could you give me your opinion, if you would be interested in amalgamating the downtown museum with the SS Sycamus to save a tremendous amount of our budget and leave the building as the natural expansion of our library? Your opinions, please. Thank you. Good question. Eucalario. I like the expanding the library idea because I know we've been discussed that for a long time and there was a lot of money that was supposed to be talked about to build a new library and all kind of stuff but the money didn't come up. But that's actually a brilliant idea. Uh, the Sycamuse is a museum as it is and it does have, I've been through it and, and it could easily lend itself to becoming a dual purpose museum. It's still the same, it's too, it, yeah, there's no point in having two museums. I think it's a brilliant idea. And it does give the opportunity to expand that library, which is kind of small, without the big cost expenditures they were talking about before, which is why the idea got canned, as it was way too much money. But that would be a workable solution, and it would also provide the Sycamus with an, an additional draw, an additional reason for people to go there. Um, I'm all for it, I think it's a good idea. Yeah. Thank you. Andrew Jacobite. Thanks, Brian. Uh, well, actually, if you look at the museum, people don't realize there's uh, almost a whole second floor underneath, or the basement underneath is all their archive storage, and it, it takes up a lot of space. And they, we're actually, yes, the museum is already short, so that's something we should be considering, and whether it moves beside the yes, Estes Sick moves, because we're going to have to create some space uh, to house all the exhibits in the museum. Uh, perhaps a better combination might be the museum and the art gallery. Uh, we need to create draws for people to see these uh, wonderful cultural uh, entities that we have in our community. They're, they're under uh, utilized. They're under, people don't see them enough. And uh, if you walk in there, there's some pretty cool things about uh, various parts of our history or our past, uh, be it Penticton or, or our valley. So uh, maybe you go see it once a year. If you're lucky, once every three years, uh, it's silly. We should be able to see it more regularly. So the logic of having it beside the SS Sycamus makes sense. 
uh, whether it's practical or there's another way of amalgamating it uh, uh, and thus freeing up spots to expand the library. Thanks. Thank you. John Vasilaki. Thank you very much. I would sure love to see the museum move from where it is so that the library can actually expand and become a truly uh, original type uh, of, of a library for the South Okanagan, even though the regional district has their own um, uh, libraries. But when it comes to, to heritage sites, to me, that's the most important thing that any community can, can have is a heritage site, which is our, the culture of this community and our transportation culture that we had for the past 100 years. And it, yeah, it's sitting in the mud, uh, but what better place can you put that beautiful ship than where it belongs on the water? And that's where it is. Uh, I think it should be refloated, but th the cost is very, very prohibitive. There's no way you can do it. Um, the, the museum, uh, like Andrew said, has another fl uh, floor full of archives down below. And I believe there's something in the works um, that's going to change all that and bring all that to the light so folks in this community and in others can really come and concentrate what our real history uh, of this area is all about and, and the people that actually grew this, uh, this area to be what it is today. Thank you. Thank you. Derek can come to the microphone, and while he's doing that, the next speaker will be Del Mazzillo. Kerry Schneiderat. Hello again, gentlemen. As you know, my name is Kerry Schneiderat. I'm the acting president of the Penticton Hawaiian Country Chamber of Commerce. This question is for all three of you, and it's on behalf of our almost 600 members. So think before you answer. <laughs> Very important. For months now, the Chamber has been working on an initiative that we call Be Bold. Uh, we have met with members of the Chamber and stakeholders in the community to identify key policy areas to promote the economic health and well-being of Penticton. From those meetings, we have commissioned a report that's called Be Bold. It speaks to bold, creative, forward-thinking ideas. That report is about to be published for the public, so keep your eyes open, everybody. But we have released to yourselves, prior to tonight, a copy of the executive summary of that report. What, for each of you, is the area that's identified in that report that you find to be the priority? Okay. Andrew. Um, there's two things, and it's all about part of my platform being an economic vibrancy. Uh, again, fostering entrepreneurship is a key thing, and creating our region as a destination. And I've been a pro proponent for trying to make ourselves a cycling precinct. And because we have cycling for all abilities, all, all levels, not just the road cycling, because we have a car, car culture that's used to that, we have uh, mountain biking, three blind mice, the, the local group here is trying to make that an international ride center is like a national park for mountain biking. It is stunning mountain biking there. And then we have the KBR Trail, which is that recreational for families, for anyone that can ride it. And there's a movement to get uh, lanes, not lanes, uh, routes along a lakeside trail from Masuyas, really past Clone up to Sam Arm, actually. And there's momentum going there. Summerland just got 400 grand to do from Summerland to Trout Creek. There is a movement there. And if we can brand ourselves as a destination uh, a lot of these people come here with big dollars. Uh, they come here, they stay here for a week. A lot of these events, they come with their families. It's, it's a great uh, opportunity to showcase us. And we have probably the most two celebrated Olympic athletes in Clara Hughes and Simon Whitfield talking about this area is probably the nicest place in the world to train or cycle. It speaks to the opportunity that's there, the huge opportunity, and we should leverage that. And that would be bold. Thank you. John. Thank you very much. Excellent question. Um, I agree with what uh, my friend to my right uh, has just finished saying, but those are all terms that are very short um, economic infusion in, into our economy. What we need is to be bold and creative. As the report said, we have to be very creative. We have to invest in our economic development department and city hall 
in order to go out there and bring those ini initiatives that we require to create work for the other 10 and a half months in this community that we don't have at the present time. A, a month and a half of, of work for mostly minimum wage jobs just isn't the right thing that we should be looking at. We should be looking to be, like they said, bold, go out there, bring jobs into this community that a family can actually live with comfortably, not having to go to the soup kitchen or any, or any other parts of, of this community in order to get enough food to leave, or, or the, um, the uh, food bank. Uh, it, for such a rich a province, a rich country, for us to be down to that level just isn't acceptable. We, we have to, to spend to take care of our people. Thank you. Thanks. Yuka. The thing that struck me the most about that report was that you asked for a vision, somebody bold enough to actually make a vision and follow through on it. And that's basically what really is required, an overall vision and an overall goal. A lot of the other points in there are very valid, and we have all those things available to us. And as a long-term goal, tourism is our, is our key. Tourism is what brings the people here. Once you have the people here and they like the, they like the city, that spurs on other small cottage industries, even larger industries. Because if we are a biking zone and say we have bike trails, we have hiking trails and all those kind of things, then if we're really well known for those things, then we can have businesses and industries that cater to those kind of people. And those aren't just tourist jobs that you know pay minimum wage for a month and a half a year. Those would be year-round jobs. They'd have peak seasons and low seasons. But if we have the events and the activities and those type of things here, then we can get the industries that support those things. But like I said, it's got to be a grand, bold vision that encompasses all things at once with a, with a goal and a target that we're trying to achieve and something that everybody can sort of at least have a consensus on and try to go towards. And tourism is, is the key that will draw the people here. Thank you. All right, Dell's coming up. And while Dell's coming up, okay, go ahead. Okay. Uh, well, that was a very interesting uh, uh, coincidence that the last question really leads into this question. And this is for all three of you. And as we know, the decisions that we make today and the actions we take in, you know, in, in the present moment are going to affect our future. So taking that even further, I would be very interested to hear uh, from each of you what your vision is, what your personal vision is, and what Penticton would look like and feel like on October the 30th, 2054. So if, if it followed the way you would like Penticton to be, what's it going to look like and feel like? And okay. uh, that's to all three. Good question. Thank you. Mr. Jacobite. I'm sorry. John. Is it John's turn? OK, but beg your pardon. Mr. Basilaki. Thank you very much. Um, very, very good, good question, but that means I have to live here for another 40 years to see what it's going to look like. <laughs> and I don't know if that's going to happen or not. Um, but what, just a few minutes ago, somebody said about our, our main purpose here is, is, is for tourism. I don't know how many of you know that the, the value uh, of the economic value that comes into Penticton year-round, and I'm talking about the community, I'm not talking about City Hall, is only 7%. That's all this community makes uh, on tourism. The majority of the value of the incomes and all the other stuff that, that we require in this community comes from the industrial area. That's our number one priority is the industrial area. And how well are we looking after it? Not very well. We, we should be 
devoting more time to where we can actually improve uh, this community, and that's through jobs. And we've got to go out there and bring those jobs into this community for our youth and our young families that we require at the present time, because we can no longer depend uh, on the folks that are on fixed incomes to pay the taxation for all the money that we spend year after year. And lo a lot of it is waste. Trust me, I know. So we, we, have to, we have to do something about that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yuka. Well. <laughs> um, Penticton itself has the potential for lots of cottage industry. Large scale industry is something we really, isn't available to us. We're in the middle of nowhere. You, don't, you can go from the coast all the way across Canada and never have to go through Penticton. You have to deliberately want to go to Penticton. We're off the highway. So you gotta attract the people here. Large scale industry is really gonna have a difficult time with that because it costs a lot of money to move stuff around because of the cost of energy. If you're gonna set up a major industry, you're gonna go to some place where you have a good infrastructure for it, easy accessibility to your market. Penticton is kind of out of the way. But we have the ability for niche markets. We have a lake. If we were like boating capital of Canada or the water sport capital of Canada, we would have all kinds of miniature industries. We were making bling for sports boats. We could be making surfboards, windsurfers. We could be, uh, boating would be a large thing. It's the type of industry that we could use here because it's the type of resources we have available. We have sunshine here, an incredible amount of sunshine. We should have solar power technologies here because we have the place where we got the sunshine to test that kind of stuff. The resources that we have are the ones we have to utilize in order to get the industries that we need. Large scale won't work, but a lot of quaint cottage industries and specialized industries would be perfect for the city of Penticton. Thank you. Andrew. Uh, 40 years, well I'll still be here, but it's... Uh, <laughs> You know, I spoke earlier about I would like to see us as a vibrant community, and, and vibrancy is an, um, something that gets bantered about, and it's not something that equates to a population. Well, once we get 40,000, then we'll be vibrant. I think, as I said before, it's a, it's a state of mind, and not my vision for us 40 years down the road is really for families to have the opportunity to actually enjoy living here. Uh, too often, many of us, uh, young and old, have our, our nose to the grindstone. We're working maybe two jobs. We don't have a chance to really go experience beaches and peaches, go do our wine tours, go float down the channel, whatever it is that people save up their whole year to come and spend a holiday here. We see it every day, we take it for granted, but we don't have a chance to explore that and enjoy that. That, I think, is what being a vibrant community is all about. We have lots of culture, lots of festivals here to be able to enjoy that, to have that as one of the things we uh, are, are are happy about what we're, we're community, that's where the whole aspect of community pride is about. Um, I want to be that mayor that restores Penticton as the envy of all other communities. I talked about a high-tech incubation center. Uh, we have Accelerate Okanagan that helps high-tech businesses get started, other ones that keep it moving forward. Uh, I talked about the animation industry being a creative cluster here. That's what I want to see, young minds uh, growing and technologies that we haven't really thought about uh, moving towards. Thank you. Thank you. All right. The last word, the last question today goes to Ashley 0486. Okay, come on up, Ashley. But we're not, uh, but this will be the end of a round two of three. Hi, Ashley, what's your question? Hi, gentlemen. Um, speaking of people coming and staying, um, tourism isn't feeding my family for eight months out of the year. So what are your plans, if any, for stimulating or attracting gainful employment opportunities in our city and keep our labor force and our fathers at home? Thank you. Uh, you good question. Yuka Lorio, you're up first. As I've already stated, the type of industries we have here, or the type of industries that are available here, would be cottage industries or smaller type of industries. If we were a major water sports center, 
We would be famous for that. People would come from all kinds of places. We could build the boats, we could build the sailboats, we could build the water skis, the bling, that kind of stuff. That is year-round employment. That is skilled work. That is the kind of work that people get paid a lot of money for. And same thing with the, uh, any other tourist things we have here. They, those are, those are in the summertime, you sure you get the students, young people, they work for all the little shops and keep them open. But the spin-offs from being famous for something is the cottage industries and the small industries you can get. And those are very well paid and they're expensive kind of products to be made. And that is the kind of thing we should focus on in order to have permanent long-term jobs. And the industries and the, and the technologies that rely on the things we have, like solar power. There's absolutely no reason why we couldn't be big on solar power where you have an incredible amount of sunshine. And those are technical traits and educated traits. Um, same with using our water resources. The things that we have are the things that we can translate into real high paying jobs. Thank you. Andrew Jacobite. Thanks, thanks Ashley. Uh, I started talking about uh, high tech incubation and, and these creative clusters and I didn't get to finish. We should be focusing more on how we can grow these small startup tech smart startups instead of into a Google or, or a Microsoft instead of trying to figure out how can we get a Google or Microsoft to come here. Uh, tourism is sort of our foot in the door and I don't think we have a strategy. It's one of the things I'd like to see us do is uh, these people that are coming here, we don't have to sell them on moving their business here or coming, going, we don't need to go to Vancouver or, or Calgary and, and, and try to sell them to move their business here. They're already coming here as, from a tourist and say, and we've never asked them, have you ever thought of moving your business here? Have you ever thought of starting a business here? We're, we're here to hold your hand and help you through that process. I think that would be a good, simple first step in encouraging people. We don't have to sell them how wonderful Penticton is because they're here exploring, exploring that. We should be targeting businesses uh, that are the professional nature of the like engineers or consultants who nowadays, as long as you have a secure office and a high-speed internet connection, you can operate from anywhere. And the cost of operation out of here versus an urban center is significantly lower and you can come here yourself or your staff and, and live here for lifestyle. And we have to target that. We don't target that. We actually, I'll explain later, how we try to, uh, with economic development, to actually uh, do those programs where we could lure, encourage people to come here and start their business here. But we didn't fund it. Thank you. John Vasilaki. Thank you. Excellent question, young lady. I love it. Um, as I said earlier in my statement, that's where our economic development uh, uh, department comes in. We have to infuse it with more funds in order to hire two or three or whatever is necessary people so that they can go externally, go outside of our community and bring those corporations into Penticton, show them what type of an area we are, how beautiful it, how beautiful it is to, to live here and bring your families here and live in peace and quiet. That's what our uh, economic uh, development is for. The, the other thing is we, we got to put a, uh, if you want to call it, uh, some kind of a, a, a book in place with all the areas of Penticton that, w that are empty we have huge buildings in this community that are empty that those corporations that you're talking about and Andrew is talking about could actually come here, set house, and bring all those people in. But first of all, what we have to do is bring in those qualified people so that once we bring those high-tech companies into place, they have someone here to hire. At the present time, we have nobody. They have to bring them externally in order to hire people for their, uh, for their companies. Thank you very much. Okay. Now, Andrew asked for a rebuttal, so go ahead. Thank you. Just on economic development, uh, my proudest moment on council a year ago was at our budget cycle. We championed getting an extra $100,000 invested in, in economic development. My saddest day was a week later when myself and Helena Conans were the only ones on council because it was passed unanimously the week before who actually stood up and said, yes, that's important for us to invest in. Um, the further punch in the gut or kick the gonads was a week later, a month later, when our economic development officer and her intern came to present, and a quote from Mr. Vasilaki was, oh, you girls do such great work. I wish I could give you more money so you could do even more great work. There was the opportunity, and we need to invest in our economic development. Okay. 
Oh, go, ahead. go ahead, John. Thank you very much. Um, Andrew, you're completely wrong about me not voting uh, along with you and, and uh, Councilor Conan's. Completely, you're, you're out of base altogether. Please, when you make statements, make sure that those statements are true and not false, okay? Um, I did vote in favor of, of giving uh, her more money. It was, she was the one that didn't want the money. Uh, so please get your facts straight, okay? Don't, don't confuse the sure. issue here. Thank you very much. Yeah, so, uh, this is getting interesting, so I'm gonna let it go for a second. <laughs> go ahead. Thank you. So a uh, statement in, in your past platform was, the power needs to be shifted back from staff to council. Here is a classic example where council had the power, despite what staff said, despite what lobbying, well, if you give 100 grand extra to this budget, then all the other departments are gonna ask for increases as well. This was our opportunity to say, economic development is something that's important. We're all gonna start talking about it this fall. There was business cases in, if we invested 20 grand here to get more people to come here, there was a, an economic impact that we realized we didn't want to invest in that, and that was our opportunity to exercise our power. John? Thank you very much. The, I believe the reason she didn't want the, those extra funds was because she's only one person. I, in order to, to really improve that department, we have to put in enough money into it to, to make some good. By putting money into it and one person cannot handle the work that's necessary to be done in order to improve this community with jobs and other stuff that we need for our people to remain here, as that young lady just stated over there. We need people to remain here, not to move to Alberta. We want them to remain here. And that's what we have to do. Economically, we have to make this community grow and if we don't put that money into it, it'll never grow, it'll remain the way it is, and that'll be too bad for us and the young people that wish to live here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Yuka, what do you think of all this? Um, <laughs> I, I don't know, I'm, just, I'm not part of the argument there, but basically, <laughs> if we want to attract industry to our city, sure we're beautiful, we've got lakes, nice place for your family, your friends, all that kind of stuff, but we've got to be able to prove to them that they can make money here, that they can operate here at a profit, and they can make a larger profit operating here than they can operating in Kelowna or anywhere else nearby. And along with you can arrange our affairs here in such a fashion that it makes it attractive enough for them to make good profits here, they will come here. As much as they like to be holistic and say they care about families, the bottom line in any company, any corporation is how much money can we make? So we can demonstrate to them that they can make money here, they will come here. Thank you. All uh, <laughs> candidates, you, uh, candidates, you may have a seat just for a moment and have some water because I'm going to take the floor for about 60 seconds. Um, we're going to have our closing remarks, but I'm going to let them have a quick breather because I want to do my thank yous. And I do ask, out of respect to all three candidates, that you please uh, stick around for the, for the six minutes because it's very distracting if somebody leaves. But I do want to do my thank yous so they can relax for a second. Um, Penticton Herald, again, thank you to my colleagues for, uh, for uh, sponsoring this event. And uh, to the Penticton Lakeside Resort, who are outstanding corporate citizens in our community, I thank them again for their continued generosity. And uh, I just had to show up and talk because the Penticton Wine Country Chamber staff and volunteers have done a great job of uh, keeping things flowing over the last two nights. So thank you very much to all of them. We, um, if you notice, Jeff back there is uh, videotaping this as well as Tuesday nights. It will be available on the Herald's website. Likely not tomorrow, but we will definitely put a huge thing right across the front page when you can watch the council meetings as well as this one. And if you're a Facebook junkie and Twitter, we'll put that up right away as well as our website, plug plug www.pinpictonherald.ca. It'll be right across the top banner um, telling you when, when the meeting is. The uh, councilor meeting will be in four sections, but nothing will be edited out, and tonight will be in two sections because it's, it was fairly long. Uh, thank you to our sound crew, and Kyle, and also Peach City Radio was here, and uh, they got a great compliment. I was speaking to uh, an older gentleman.
who couldn't make it out on Tuesday, and he listened to it on uh, internet radio and said it was outstanding and the commentary was good. So please check them out because they want to be a big part of this community. <laughs> and uh, it's www.peachcityradio.org, is that correct? So yeah, write that down. And th these guys have been great. I'm going to kind of miss them this week. So, uh, um, and thank you folks for coming out, but we're not done, so I do ask that you bear with us for a few more moments because they're allowed closing remarks. Now, nobody can rebut the closing remarks or whatever. And <laughs> if you didn't get a chance to ask a question, um, the, uh, the, their emails are on literature, and we have a lot of the council candidates here tonight, so if they hand you a brochure, please take it because they want you to know who they are. And uh, I'm sure I can speak for them. If you did email them, I'm sure they'll make every effort to answer your question. So we drew for, so John um, spoke first. So last. John spoke last, so that means you get to go first now, John. Uh, okay. Two minutes, we will give you the bell at 145, and we'll start now. Are you officially ready now? I is. You are, okay. <laughs> you've, got the, you've got the correct papers? I've got it. Thank you okay. very much. <laughs> We're all set. Okay. Okay. Timers, go. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I've lived in, in Penticton for 60 years. I married my, uh, my high school sweetheart. We have two wonderful kids. One of them was here. The other one lives in Chilliwack, and they blessed us with four, four great grandkids. One of them is named Johnny, and there's another John Vasilaki coming near you. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, you all have a lot to digest from what you have heard to, uh, this evening. I want to have the opportunity to lead Penticton forward as your mayor for the next four years. I have worked tirelessly for the development and improvement of our city, and I will continue to do so. The future of Penticton rests in your, in your hands. You must decide who has the most experience, the most knowledge, the most qualifications to act on your behalf to govern wisely, honestly, and responsibly. Please think very, very seriously on what I said this evening, because it truly comes from my heart. Please make the right decision and vote John Vasilaki for mayor on November the 15th, 5th, and 6th. God bless you all. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, speaking uh, with his two minute wrap up, uh, please welcome to the mic one last time, Yuka Lorio. I have a grand scheme for the city of Penticton. It's huge. I technically want, I want to redesign the whole city, basically, over the like, next 20 years. So it has specific purposes and reasons to exist. It's, it's not something that, you know, there's not going to be no quick fix. Like if I give a mayor, you know, the city's not going to be prosperous six months later. It's a long-term thing. It's like a one pebble at a time. But if we can set the goal and actually set an idea of what it is we want to do, we can take small steps towards that direction, a little at a time. And slowly but surely, we can develop a, a balanced community that is prosperous. I've, I grew up in Victoria. I watched Victoria when they made their decision to concentrate on tourism. And I, I watched them slowly. They all got together, the entire city, all the people in it decided that's what they're going to do. It is a very prosperous city now. They did the same thing with Whistler. They, Ottawa's done the same thing. There's no reason why Penticton can't, with a long-term vision, do exactly the same thing. And I have an idea. I know it'll work. And I know I can bring money into this city. We need revenue. The more money we can get into this city, the more money the businesses get. Once the businesses get money, we're a taxing authority. We can take some of it back. <laughs> but they have to have the money first. If they're rich, nobody ever argues about taxing the rich. But they, you know, nobody likes taxing the poor. So we've given the revenue, make them rich. We'll take a little bit back, spend more on the city. But it's a long-term plan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Yuka. And uh, with his wrap-up, and for the final time this evening, please welcome back to the mic, Mr. Andrew Jacobite. Thank you, and thank you for the opportunity to be here. You know, it's been said if I could motivate the younger voter to actually go out and vote, it would greatly benefit my campaign. And only in Penticton, someone like myself who's 43 is still considered part of the youth vote. And when I say young people, 
you know, it's, it's associated with party years or troublemakers, but I tell you, the youth are the ones that are going to build that patient care tower. Youth are the ones that are going to be checking you in, helping to your room, checking your blood pressure, running the tests, and the doctor who's going to help you. We need to create an environment where youth feel valued, have things to do, and contribute to the vibrancy of our community. This election is not about young versus old or picking the best of the worst. It's about choosing a leader, the face of the community, someone who people respect, someone who believes in and is a team builder, a leader who, when he speaks, people listen, not because they're curious or scared of the words that are going to come out of their mouths, but one who reaffirms community pride and a passion for moving Penticton forward. We live in the best city in the world, yet many of us struggle to keep our heads above water. I want to be the mayor that helps navigate us to calmer waters and empower council to be able to throw out some lifelines to help us get us back on our feet. We have an opportunity to make Penticton the envy of all other communities. I've proven that I am willing to work and do community initiatives and put my money where my mouth is. There are a lot of solid candidates for council. And as your mayor, while I don't get to choose who sits on council, I can promise you I will work hard to challenge, motivate, and empower council. And as a team, we will address the issues and move our community forward. I'm Andrew Jacobite. I'm looking for your support this November 15th. Thank you. Thank you. So those, uh, those who uh, do require transportation, please see uh, Martin Lewis at the back. Hey, you're a great audience. Nobody threw anything, swore, or whatever. Thank you so much for coming tonight, and get home safely. Good night, everybody.